to welcome everyone today. And if you are a guest with us today, we welcome you. We're so glad to have you in service with us today. Hope and pray that the presence of the Lord touches you today. If you're joining us online, wherever you're watching from, welcome you to be a part as a part of this service pray that the lord touches you wherever you are i want to say it's great to have the enoch evans family in service with us today <laughs> living in georgia for a number of years now and they're up here they also are up here with dylan and his fiance charity we welcome them Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Esther chapter 4, beginning, begin reading with verse number 1. Esther 4 and verse number 1. When Mordecai perceived all that was done... Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry and came even before the king's gate for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to, the, to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. What's going on, Mordecai? So Hatak went. For to Mordecai under the street of the city which was born, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and, un, and to Declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai, and again, again Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. So Mordecai, in essence, is telling Esther, you, you need to do something to intervene on our behalf. If you're not overly familiar with the story, basically what's going on is there's been a decree that all of the Jews are going to be destroyed. That's what has Mordecai in, in, in the state that he is in. And, and, and Mordecai is saying, Esther, you, you need to do something. God has positioned you to do something. But, but this is her response in verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever... Whether man or woman shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to, to one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live, but I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. Father, thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for the privilege you've given us to join together and lift up and exalt your name, the name that is above every name. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you today, God. Thank you for this opportunity you've given us to be here today, Lord, not to go through some kind of religious ritual, but to experience your presence, to lift up and exalt you, but also to receive from you whatever it is you would desire to do in our lives today. And I pray, God, that now through your word you would continue to work, that you would minister to us today through your word, that you would speak to us today. Lord, I don't want to just preach a sermon this morning as a, as a part of this service, but I want to be a messenger to deliver a message from you. 
So I trust you today. I depend upon you today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. If you're not really familiar with the story of Esther, I would encourage you to read the chapter. It's only, I think, about four or five chapters. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing testimony of the power of God to deliver. I have preached many times about this story and focused on this story, but really that's, that's not the focus today. In fact, all of that really was to just kind of give a launching point of what I feel led to minister about here this morning. 1 John 4 and verse number 10, John says, Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. I think sometimes people have an attitude that God is fortunate. That they are scheduling Him into their lives. That they are giving Him some time. I mean, it's a a holiday weekend. Those of you that live in the Cape St. Clair, St. Margaret's area, you're well aware of it's a holiday weekend. As I think just about all of Maryland, Friday afternoon and evening and yesterday was heading to the beach. We live in the St. Margaret's area and I always can tell how much carnality and humanity is at work when all of those people are on the roads that they're not supposed to be on because they're looking for shortcuts and messing up all of us locals. (laughs) Holiday weekend, and look look at us, Aren't aren't we something? In spite of the fact it's a holiday weekend, we've, we've taken time to come. That, that's, we've, we've taken time to honor God with, with our presence today. John says love, it's, it's not about the fact that you and I love Him. What is amazing is He loves us. You see, there is a need for a proper perspective on some things. Otherwise, you don't understand the value and the significance of them. I I have experienced, not only in observation on social media and YouTube and things like that, but but I have also, in, in personal settings, I have experienced this this, this kind of a, I, I guess I could call it a trend that seems to be going on in, in the world for, for I, several years at least now amongst Christianity. And that is making God sort of our, you know, our, our buddy. My, he, he, he's my BFF. We, you know, we, God and I, we're good. Now, now hear me please, I believe that you and I have access and should have a personal intimate relationship with God. But this idea of trying to just bring God down to being one of us, the problem with that is there's some things we cannot really understand and the significance of those things when we make God just, you know... I believe in prayer, if, if, you, if you think that prayer is supposed to be in King James English, that, that's not the case. You, you, don't have to use the, you don't have to use these and thous and blesseth and curseth and all those other things when you, when you pray. That, that, you, you can pray in just language that you're comfortable with. But, but, but I think if we're, if, we're, if we're not careful, we can, we can kind of swing the pendulum too far on that. I, I've been in some situations where I've heard people, and, and I mean, it's just, it, it's, just like they're, it's just like they're talking to just the, the guy at wherever, I don't know, on the basketball. Uh, yeah, God, so, you know, if you could... Uh, 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 God, yeah, if, uh, you know, people are lost, God, so yeah, you know, you can kind of help them out, that'd be good. Now please, I'm going to say it again, 
you and I should have. <laughs> this book is all about you and I having a personal, intimate relationship with God. But, but at the same time, if we're not careful, we, we can reduce him to one of us that he becomes so common to us that there are some things that we miss the significance of them. Esther is in the position that God has intentionally put her in because God knew what was coming. Let me, just, let me just pause for a moment and tell you, there is not one single thing going on in your world individually today that God was not aware of it before it ever happened and already has it worked out. You, you may not see how, you may not know how, you may not know when, but before it ever got to you, God already knew about it and figured it all out. You read the story of Esther and you read the, 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 how Esther ended up in the king's palace and how Esther became the queen. It, it all seems like coincidence, but it really wasn't. God was behind it all, orchestrating all of it to get Esther to the palace at the right time for these circumstances. Mordecai believes that, even though Esther seems to be struggling with it. So Mordecai says, Esther, you've, you've got to go before the king. You're the only one that can do it. You, you've got to go and appeal to the king that he's got, to, he's got to overturn this decree that's been given. But Esther, the queen, I, besides the king, I, I, would, I would think the queen would be the second most important person out of anybody. This isn't just one of the king's advisors. This, this isn't just the king's right-hand man. This is the queen. And the queen says, you, you tell Mordecai, nobody can just come before the king uninvited. You take your life into your own hands when you initiate going to see the king. If the queen felt that way, I wonder what everybody else felt. If she knew I don't just flippantly show up to see the king, he, he, he may hold out his scepter and that means it's okay. But you catch him on the wrong day. He may not put out the scepter. And that's not just a, oh my bad. You lose your life. Adam Clark says this about this, this idea. He says, we have already seen that the Persian sovereigns affected the highest degree of majesty, even to the assuming of divine honors. No man nor woman dared to appear unveiled before them without hazarding their lives. Into the inner chamber of the harem no person ever entered but the king and the woman he had chosen to call thither. None even of his courtiers or ministers dared to appear there, nor the most beloved of his concubines except led there by himself or ordered to come to him. Jameson Fawcett and Brown says this on this idea Whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called. The Persian king surrounded themselves with an almost impassable circle of forms. The law alluded to was first enacted by Diocese, king of Media, and afterward when the empires were united, adopted by the Persians, that all business should be transacted and petitions transmitted to the king through his ministers, and although the restriction was not intended, of course, to apply to the queen, yet from the strict and inflexible character of the Persian laws and the extreme desire to exalt the majesty of the sovereign, even his favorite wife had not the privilege of entry except by special favor and indulgence. 
Esther was suffering from the severity of this law. And as from not being admitted for a whole month to the king's presence, she had reason to fear that the royal affections had been alienated from her. She had little hope of serving her country's cause in this awful emergency. You, you don't just pop in to see the king. And when the king hasn't called for you in a month, you definitely don't pop in to see the king. Based on the, the majesty, the greatness of the king, you don't just show up and come and see him. You, you, you don't just pop in. Anybody got any friends or family members you're comfortable just popping in on them? Anybody? I'm going to pray for a bunch of you. Because if you don't have people you can just pop in on, you, you, you're missing out. I go to my parents' house, I don't even, I don't even call. If the door's locked, it's got a keypad, I know the code. I just walk in. I expect my kids to do the well, ones that don't live there anymore. I expect them to do the same thing. I, 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 got, I got some friends that I'd, I would be comfortable just popping in on. They might not be comfortable with me popping in, but... <laughs> Hold on a minute. You got to stay out there for a couple minutes. We got we to gotta throw everything in the closet real quick. You don't, just, you don't just show up to see the king, even if you're the king's wife. Listen to what David said in Psalms 111 in verse number 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. The complete Jewish Bible says it this way, The first and foremost point of wisdom is the fear of Adonai. All those living by it gain good common sense. His praise stands forever. Boy, does our world need some good common sense. Most of the issues in our world today could be dealt with with a little bit of good common sense. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's just good common sense. David seemed to get this through to Solomon, his son, because in Proverbs 1 and 7, it's a little bit different, but very similar. Solomon says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. I, I think you could say it this way, the, the fear of the Lord is the foundation. So if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you can't have wisdom. And if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you can't have knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. Can I tell you that, that, that in the context of what I'm saying this morning, we, we have in Christianity reduced or tried to eliminate the fear of the Lord. God just, he, he's, you know, he, he's, he's my buddy. Yeah, I get it. He'll never leave you. He'll never. Fr I get all those things. I know all those things. But there's still a need. And the word fear here, it's not, it's not, it's not about being afraid. I, I don't know what it, I have never been the most daring of people when I was when I was in my teen years and at least into my twenties. I would ride just about any roller coaster and I don't like heights in and of themselves, but I, I, I wouldn't hesitate on a roller coaster. I don't know when the last time I've been on one, and I'm not sure if I will ever be on one again. <laughs> I've seen too many videos on social media of that thing getting stuck at the top of the 785-foot hill and everybody having to climb down. Nope. And I, 
I, I don't know, I just, we, we were in Niagara Falls for part of our trip this past week, and, 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 and we rode the Maid of the Mist boats, and they take you up into the falls, but to get there, you go out on this, this kind of a bridge thing and down an elevator, and, and I got about halfway, it's probably from about here to the back wall from the bridge part of it. Man, I got about halfway out on there and got to looking down and thinking about where I was, and I'm, this ain't, this ain't good. Then we went up into the, the tower there on the Canadian side, which in comparison to a lot of other buildings and towers, it's not very tall. And I'm telling you what, the last several, I was in the back. They'd had glass, and the rest of the family was in front. I was in the back like this. If you can't see me in the back, my eyes are closed. <laughs> I'm telling you what, the last couple of seconds, my heart started picking up speed, and everybody else was having a good time. That, that's, that's not the fear here. Tuesday is my one-year anniversary from a snake in my grill. I know the date. I'll always know that date. That was, that was fear. All of you people that don't care, you don't mind snakes... You need prayer. That, that's not what this is talking about here. It's not talking about the terror, scared of the Lord. In fact, the word in the Hebrew basically means this. It is reverence. Now, I will tell you, if you were to read, in fact, the, the whole, I'll give you the whole definition here of the word fear. It's, it's fear, it's terror, it's fearing, it's fear, terror. It is, awesome or ter it is aw awesome or terrifying thing. But with regards to God, it is, it is respect, reverence. It is, it is awe. It's awe, it's a reverence of how big He is. It's a reverence of how amazing he is. It's, it's a reverence of his holiness. It's a respect for who he is. That is the beginning of wisdom. And how many unwise people, I don't care how many people say that what you and I are doing here today is crazy. I don't care. This was here before they got here. And it's going to be here after they're gone. This was here before our government got here. And it's going to be here when it's gone. I don't care what our government says is okay now. I don't care what laws, moral laws, the government now says are okay to violate. This was here before that. And this will be here when all of that is gone. America is not eternal, but the word of God is. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but this book, this word, is never going to pass away. So you can choose to put your trust in something that is unstable, but my hope is built on nothing less than the eternal, unchanging word of God. Call me what you want to call me. Label me what you want to label me. Put whatever category you want to put me in. I still choose to believe what this book says. Yes. Celebrate for an entire month something that is contrary to this book. It's a free country. Do whatever you want to do. But as for me and my house, I'm going to stand on what the Word of God says. You know it oh boy stay with the notes stay with the notes stay with the notes it kind of hit me the other day do you know the things we promote to celebrate with pride the things that get pushed to celebrate with pride are things that are contrary to the word of god
Don't go around celebrating with pride what is the principles of this book. Heaven and earth. I don't care if it's Democrats, Republicans, whatever other party. In the, I don't care. Doesn't matter. As for me and my house, the fear of the Lord, the reverence and respect of God. Blows my mind the mess this world is in by rejecting this book and we still get it pushed down our throat to reject this book. Where's that gotten you? How has that helped you? The fear of the Lord is the only place to have wisdom from. It's the only starting point if you want wisdom. The fear of the Lord, according to Jameson Fawcett Brown says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The short-sighted wisdom of this world regards the fear of God as a secondary consideration. And selfish gains and honors are the primary object of life. Wow, wow, wow. Is that not such a sobering description of our world? It's all about me. It's all about my happiness. It's not, it doesn't matter how it affects others. It doesn't, it doesn't matter the pain and the heartache it causes others. It's just about pleasing me. But far-seeing faith looks beyond the present to the end. The fear of the Lord is childlike reverential fear of Him whose name is holy and reverend. This fear calls forth love and delight in His commandments. Not, not fear and trepidation. If I don't, if I don't obey God's commandments, He's going he's to shoot me with a lightning bolt. It's, it's the same, in, in a lot of ways it's the same attitude that a husband or a wife should have towards their spouse. I don't live in fear that my wife is, is, going to, is going to do something to hurt me if I don't please her. I desire to please her. I, I desire to make her happy as best I can because that, that helps with a healthy relationship. I'm not, I'm not trying to avoid God frying me. Psalmist said he, he delights in his commandments. They're, they're not grievous. They're, they're not a burden to bear. I believe it's in the book of James. James talks about the law of liberty. You know, there is not a person in this room that has a faith problem. Not one single person. Every person in this room are people full of faith. The question is where your faith is, it is what it's being put in. I don't, I don't see Sister Tyler unless I'm missing her. Hopefully she's watching. Sister Tyler this morning, probably tonight as well, be a bunch of vacation-inspired preaching. It, it just, all of you... Law-abiding citizens on the highway, God bless you. All of you that set the cruise control exactly where the speed limit is, you are my heroes. But I don't want to be like you. <laughs> and and, and it, it, it dawned on me several times this last week as, as I'm driving down the highway how much faith I have in ways. <laughs> I resisted using ways for the longest amount of time. I stuck with Google because I didn't deserve to know where the cops were. I'm choosing to speed if I, I, I ought to get what I deserve. But I, 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 I crossed over. <laughs> the bottom line is, I am trusting that drivers ahead of me are doing their job to 
let me know where the cops are. We don't have faith problems. No, the end of the story is not a ticket. I've been clean for seven years now. We have faith. It's just where we're putting our faith. You, you go, go drive across the bridge. Most of you got to drive across the bridge to get home. You, you got faith. Why in the world can we have faith in all of that stuff? And we can't have faith in the one that created all of this? To trust that he's got, he's got my world in his hands. So it, it, I, this isn't about f- fear in the sense of, 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 of terror, but it's about a respect and a reverence of who he is and the fact that, 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 that I, I, I want to live according to his laws. Because the only, and oh, I, I didn't finish my point. James says that it's the law of liberty. There's no liberty without law. That seems, that feels contradictory. But you can't have liberty without law. As long as you drive the speed limit, you have liberty. If you don't drive the speed limit and ways isn't accurate, you might lose your liberty. There is a law of liberty. Liberty does not come by getting rid of law. Oh, hallelujah. Liberty does not come by deciding I'm going to live my life separate and apart from this book. In fact, you want bondage? That's the way to get bondage. Because this is the law of liberty. There's another law that's a law of bondage. That's why we're constantly pushing the limits in our world. I didn't intend to make so many references in this message this morning, but here it goes. We ended up not doing it, but we, were, we had thought about going to, to, to Toronto this past week, at least for part of a day, and, and, and the CN Tower. Anybody ever been to or anybody ever seen pictures of the CN Tower in Toronto? One of the, I think it's one of the tallest of its type. I don't know when they did it, but it's not good enough anymore just to go up the tower and walk around the observation deck. You can now pay, I think, $200, $250 to go on the roof of the tower for them to hook you up with a harness and a cable and lean out over the edge. I'm trying to be very careful what I'm about to say next because one of my sons-in-law said he would do it and one of my sons said he would do it. I thought I raised smarter sons than that. I didn't raise my son-in-law. It's not good enough. Any. We, 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 we got to go up. We got we to gotta push the limits. There's a law of liberty. And that law of liberty is living within the confines of this book. Oh, hallelujah. Stay with me. It it, it gets a little better. It does. Job said it this way, or not actually it wasn't Job. It was one of Job's friends that said this in, in Job 37 and 22. He says, fair weather cometh out of the north. With God is terrible majesty. Great majesty. The word terrible there is, is the root word of the word fear of the Lord. So where, where, where David says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that, that's the root, the, the word terrible is a root word of that. Majesty is grandeur. It is an imposing form and appearance. 
According to Oxford Dictionary, it is impressive stateliness, dignity, or beauty. You and I come and go freely in the presence of God. In the Old Testament, when there was the tabernacle and God didn't dwell in people yet the way He now dwells in us. And, and there was that tabernacle that was the, the focal point of God's presence. And, and, and inside of that tabernacle, was the, there was the outer court, there was the holy place, and there was the, the holy of holies. And, 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 and the ultimate place you wanted to get to was that holy of holies, because that's where the presence of God was. But, but to get there, when you came in from, that, from the outside and you entered that outer outer court, the first thing that you encountered was a, was the, the term is losing my blank, the, the uh, laver of water, the brazen laver of water, this, this place where the first thing you did was you washed, then, then there was, then after that there was an altar for sacrifice, to get to the presence of God. That was a part of the process. Because if you tried to get into where the presence of God was without going to the pro through the proper process, you would die. How many of y'all would be here this morning if you knew that if you did not go through the proper process to come, you might die here? I kind of have a feeling the building would be a little more empty than it is, Brother Tony. Yeah, I'll watch online. Oh, look, another one bites the dust. That was, in fact, it was, it was, it was, it was such a place of reverence that only one person went. One time a year. The Bible tells us that when Jesus died, that after Jesus' death, the, the veil of the temple was rent. It was torn in two. I, I believe part of the symbolism of that was the fact that God was sending a message. That now, getting to the place of my presence, everybody is welcome. It's not just for one person anymore. Anybody can come. But here's the problem. The fact that he made it accessible did not mean that he overthrew the process. So now people show up in church on Sunday morning having committed adultery or fornication the night before and just do their little praise and worship thing because they don't have a God that they fear. Maybe before I die, I'll get to preach fun holiday weekend messages. Drinking and drugging on Saturday night, and you walk into church on Sunday morning, and the. Oh boy, I better. In the club looking atmosphere of a church. You ought to take note when the church is turning down the lights. God is a God of light. So we come in and just as I am, yes, that's one of the old ones, just as I am without, yeah, absolutely. I can't, how else do I come to God but just as I am? I don't get right to come to God. I don't get everything in order to come to God. I don't get everything in my God. I messed up the tape. What color? I don't I don't I don't and I can't earn my salvation. Impossible. Which one is this, Brother Andrew? Solo. Impossible. I don't get right to come to God. I come to God to get right. But I also don't come to God with this arrogant attitude that says, you just got to take me as I am. 
I'm coming just as I am, but I'm coming just as I am with some faith and confidence in the power of your blood, in the sacrifice on Calvary, that I may come just as I am, but I don't have to stay just as I am, that your grace and your mercy is going to transform me. Terrible majesty. I've heard this verse, I've, many, I've read it, I, I, I know, and I, maybe I've heard it, but I've read it at least several times, but several years ago, my wife and I had the opportunity to attend the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C., and, and a guy got up there, and I forget the name of, of, his, of his organization, but, but it's a non-profit that, that fights against uh, slavery, because there are millions of people that are enslaved in this world today. And he says that every, to every single day, they, they take, I think he said 30 minutes. Everything in their office stops for 30 minutes for them to contemplate the terrible majesty, his words, his quote of God. The reverence and the respect of the Lord is where life starts. I, I really, I didn't plan to use so many things from this past week so quickly. We ended up going to Rochester, New York for a couple of days. Didn't really know much about Rochester, but wanted to tack on a couple more days. And in the course of it, discovered a couple of days before going there that Rochester, New York is the is the home of Kodak. Kodak film. Kodak whatever. George George Eastman was the founder of Kodak. And there's a museum. It's now a museum for Kodak. But it was actually his house. And I guess you could classify it as a mansion. I don't know what a mansion exactly is, but it was a mansion. Massive house. It had, I think it's called the conservatory, I think. Conservatory inside the house. It's almost as big as this platform. Square footage-wise, I would venture to say that that house is comparable to this building. Overall square footage. Mr. Eastman never married, never had kids. There's a pipe, I've seen pipe organs in churches. He had a pipe organ in his house. And it would turn on automatically in the mornings so that when he got up in the mornings, it, the house wouldn't be quiet and silent. I don't know where he would rank in terms of today's wealth, but he'd be up there. And at 70-something years old, wrote about a one-sentence note, took a gun, and shot himself in the chest. And the note basically said something along the lines of, I've finished my purpose. There's people sitting here this morning that you, you think if you just, if you could just get a raise. You'd, you'd be happy. Some of you sitting here, if you could just move to a nicer neighborhood, you'd be happy. You could just drive a better car. You, you'd finally be, if you could go on the choice vacation you want, you'd, you'd finally be happy. No, what you would find is no matter how many toys and no matter how much wealth you accumulate, all of it starts with a reverence and a respect for God. Outside of that, there is no life. No life. So let me, let me try to bring this home here. You tell you tell you tell Mordecai I 
I can't, I can't just go in unannounced. I could lose my life. Forget the fact all of you are about to lose yours. I might lose my life because you don't enter into the presence of the king without an invitation. I want to read some verses to you that many of you, I know you've heard them. Some of you probably know them by heart. But I hope that maybe there's a little bit different perspective on them in the light of what Esther faced. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 14 says this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let's read that without the double negatives. Let's just read it into what it's saying. For, For we have a high priest who is touched by the feeling of our infirmities and was in all points tempted like we were, but without sin. Now watch this. Let us. Without the fear of the Lord, you lose some of the significance of this verse. Without a reverence for God, you lose some of the amazingness that you and I can come boldly to the throne of grace that we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. The Amplified says it this way, Let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners, that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need, appropriate help, and well time coming just when we need it. The very context of the place that Esther says, I'm not going in there unannounced because I I could lose my life. You and I have now been given access to come boldly before the throne of grace and to get help with whatever it is we have need of. If it's forgiveness of sins, there's help there. If it's deliverance from addiction, there's help there. If there's salvation you need, there's help there. And you can come boldly before the throne, not just because God's your best buddy, but because of everything that was done to provide that access. Not mistaken, I think it's a story of, uh, excuse me, a picture of John F. Kennedy's son, or one of his sons, a little three or four, five-year-old standing in the Oval Office. He didn't walk in there with the same trepidation that others might because there was, there was a relationship. I, I, don't, I don't have to come before His throne out of fear because, because ultimately that's my Father sitting on the throne. But there is still a value and a health to having a reverence. (laughs) That I'm not just just coming to hang out and, and chill with my best friend. I am entering into where terrible majesty is. And the fact that I can walk in there boldly and get whatever it is I have need of should make it all the more valuable to us. Too many people, church, and God is a take it or leave it thing. I'll go if it's comfortable. I'll go if it's convenient. I'll go if it fits in my schedule. I'll I'll give God some time. What, What that is, that's somebody that's lost their reverence of God. They've lost their fear of the Lord because when you have that fear of the Lord, it's it's not a take it or leave it thing. 
But again, it's not, if I don't do this, he's just going to, he's going to fry me and I'm done. No. It's the thankfulness that when I walk in his ways and I delight in him, there is, there is joy. There is an abiding joy. There is a peace that surpasses all of my understanding. I, I, I'm, I'm, unless you got your head in the sand, you, you got to know we're living in a crazy world. I'll try to make this the last one. We were, in, we were in Rochester early in the day for lunch on Wednesday. Went to our Airbnb, which was about 15, 20 minutes north of the city. Came back in that night and it was almost kind of eerie because everything we could see clearly during the day was not clear anymore. That haze from the fires from Canada had moved in. The drive home on Friday was a much different drive. Drive up there, lots of pretty scenery, mountains and valleys, beautiful green valleys. But on the way back Friday, it was just covered in haze. Anybody miss the news of what happened about 15 minutes from here last night? Anybody that's not aware that Several hours ago, in the Brooklyn Park area, there was a mass shooting, a couple of fatalities, numerous people went to the hospital. It's not thousands of miles away, folks. That's not on the other side of the country. If you're not familiar with this area, get on the road right in front of this church, start driving. You drive right into Brooklyn Park. You see, here's the deal. You will reverence what you fear. And you fear what you reverence. What do you fear today? Some of you don't fear God. You fear what's going on in our world. You fear the latest diseases. You fear the latest troubles, the latest economy. You... No, no. I believe it's in 2 Kings 20. The prophet Isaiah comes to the king Hezekiah. And he comes to him and he says, uh, your, your, your time is up. You're going to die. God says, you're, you're finished. And, and Hezekiah responds and, and pleads with God, pleads with Isaiah for more time. And so God responds through Isaiah and says to Hezekiah, I'm going to give you 15 more years. Here's what's really interesting to me. When Isaiah comes to Hezekiah and says, you're going to die, he automatically believes it and prays to live. But then when, Hez then, excuse me, then when Isaiah says, okay, God's going to answer your prayer, to that he responds and says, give me a sign. So you're given this word of doom and gloom and you believe it. But now you're told something positive and you say, prove it. That's really a lot like us. You tell somebody a pandemic is here, everybody's willing to go and shut down. Tell them it's over. Prove it. What are you reverencing today? Because here's the problem. 
when, when you're reverencing something other than God, that fear is a different fear. That fear is a fear that causes anxiety. It is a fear that causes you to be afraid. It is a fear that leads to terror. It's a fear that disturbs your peace. The fear of the Lord gives you peace. Oh, Jesus. I was really hoping to somehow finish this off in an upbeat way with the songs this morning, but it's not working. As much as I would love to end this off with you getting a fresh baptism of joy, I didn't expect to end this way, but here's why. There's some of you in this place that you need a fresh baptism of the fear of the Lord. Again, that not not to lead to. I wouldn't trade my life for anything. I don't live in the fear of the Lord perfectly, but I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I. I been married for 31 years. I, I, got, I got four kids, two sons-in-law now, grandkid on the way. I got, I got the aches and pains in my just like the right. Got some trouble, but I wouldn't trade it. For those that are living without the fear, I wouldn't trade my life for them for nothing. Preaching to some young people here today. You are bombarded like no other generation has ever been bombarded before. You, 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 social media is sending messages. You're going to school, and schools are telling you. Crazy if you want to live a life believing in the in the Bible. You're crazy if you believe in God. You're, you're, you're crazy if you believe what the Bible says. Where is it getting us? How much better off is our nation now that we've forsaken God? How much better off are we now that we pushed God out of every we we you can't pray in school anymore, but you can be told that alternative lifestyles are acceptable and you ought to consider maybe you're... Where, what in the world? You, 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 there's something wrong with you if you want to pray in school, but you're okay if you want to push things that are contrary. To, how did we get here? Because you can't have wisdom without a reverence for God. You can't have life without a reverence for God. Because here's, here's the deal. The one that I'm preaching about, he, he said when he, was, when he was in this earth, he said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. This fear and reverence is not so that you can live some boring, depressing lifestyle. It's so that you can have life and life that is more abundant. I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. I'm no longer bound. There's no chains holding me. It's such a blessing. My soul is resting. Praise the Lord. I'm, I know this to the natural mind. This sounds crazy, but I'm resting in the fear of the Lord. I'm, I'm resting in the fear, the reverence of the Lord. Because it's that same reverence and fear that causes me to have confidence. He's got everything in control. He's got everything in control. 
That terrible majesty is not just for me to be afraid of. That terrible majesty is for me to know that with all the chaos and turmoil in this world today, there's some terrible majesty. There is a God who is above it all. There's a God that's got it all under control. Even when I don't understand what he's doing or what he's not doing, he is in control. And it all works according to His plan and purpose. Read your Bible. We think the only people God uses in office are the people we voted for. You don't know your Bible. God. God decides. God decides. And brother, right, how are we in the can? I can't explain. There's a lot of things about this I can't explain to you. But I have faith, I have confidence. So this morning, maybe I can end this on a little bit more of an up note. <laughs> Esther says, I, I can't go before the king because I take my life into my own hands. But today, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you're struggling with today, no matter what you're bound by today, there is an invitation to come boldly. Let me, let me, read, let me read the definition of that word boldly real quick. That word boldly, come boldly before the throne of grace. That, that word means Freedom in speaking, unreservedness in speech, free and fearless confidence, free and fearless confidence. That when I come before the throne of grace, I'm not coming before the throne of grace afraid that He's going to execute judgment, but I'm coming before the throne of grace. Yes, I am reverencing the one on the throne, but I'm also coming to one who is going to give me what I need. If it's grace I need, He's going to give me grace. If it's mercy I need, He's going to give me mercy. Whatever help I need, I, unlike Esther, can come boldly only before the king of kings. Esther was afraid to come before a king. I said, Esther was afraid to come before a king. But you and I have access to come before the king. Not just any king, but the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the first, the last, the beginning, the end, which was, which is, which is to come, the Almighty, the Shepherd, the Healer, the Provider, the Deliverer, whatever I need, He is. That's the one I can come with reverence and respect before and get whatever I need. Oh, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God, renew in this place right now a fear of the Lord, not a terror, not being afraid of, but a reverence and a respect for your greatness, your holiness, your majesty, your terrible majesty, so that when I come freely before you to get whatever I need, I'm not doing it flippantly or haphazardly, but I'm doing it with great reverence and respect for the one that I'm coming before. Come on, whatever it, whatever way it is that the Lord is talking to you right now, what, whatever it is and whatever specifically He's dealing with you about right now in this message, would you just respond to Him? You can do that right where you are. Others have come to this altar if that's what you want to do, however you want to do it. But I, I invite you to come boldly today. I invite you to come boldly, reverencing Him for who He is, but with a greater appreciation for the access that you have. 
What an amazing thing it is that you and I can come before the throne of grace without fear. Esther came with fear. Esther came with trepidation. But you and I can come with confidence that I can get what I need. Take your hands and take your In the name of Jesus, I pray that you would give somebody grace and strength today. No matter what the world is saying, no matter what the world is promoting, they would choose God. Choose to live in the fear of you and your word. The only way to have true life. The only path that leads to true life. In the name of Jesus. You don't need to respond for yourself right now. Would you be sensitive to the Lord to lead you? Come on, if you don't need to pray for yourself right now, would you let the Lord use you to minister to someone else? Take your throne, Holy One. Jesus, you're the only one found In the name worthy. of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. The only one found worthy. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Take your throne, Holy One. There's grace. There's mercy. Whatever you need is available. Just don't treat it lightly. Don't treat it with a flippant attitude. Don't treat it with a take it or leave it attitude. But with reverence and respect. All for the fact that I can come before the throne of grace. No matter what I've done, I can come. I can speak freely. I can be transparent. I can be open with the King. I can be honest with the King and He's going to help me. I can be honest with the king and he's going to show mercy. He holds all power, riches, wisdom, and strength. In the name of Jesus. Honor, glory, and blessing. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, and strength. Honor, in the name of Jesus, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes. It is the name above all names. He holds all power, riches, wisdom, and strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Oh, hallelujah. Worthy. Oh, you're worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Riches, wisdom, and strength. Honor, glory, and blessing. In the name of Jesus. 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 He holds all power. Hallelujah. Wisdom, and strength. Honor, glory, and blessing. Hallelujah. Take your throne, Holy One. Jesus, Hallelujah. you're the only one. In the name found of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. The only one found worthy. Hallelujah. Take your throne, Holy One. Jesus, in the name you're of Jesus. the only one found worthy. Hallelujah. Take your throne. 
There are many that are still praying, but if you need to go, want to go, you're welcome to. Thank you for being here with us today. If the Spirit of the Lord is still talking to you, ministering to you, would you, would you allow Him to continue to do that? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. 